The War of the Ancient Dragons began thousands of years ago, and the Erdtree capital came under siege, led by a gargantuan dragon named Gransax. The dragons wielded heavenly bolts of red lightning, and so the knights of the Erdtree learned to fortify themselves against it, and stayed on the defensive until Godwin the Golden delivered the decisive blow. He stood before another legendary dragon known as Dread Fortisax and defeated him. But instead of granting death, he showed mercy. He offered friendship, and it was with this act that the ancient dragons and the Golden Order truly became one. Years later, a dire plot was put into action, a plan to kill Godwin the Golden. So a fragment of the Rune of Death was stolen from the Black Blade that was designed to contain it. This fragment was then inscribed onto a set of Black Knives, which the Black Knife assassins would wield, and with cloaks of silver that fooled the eye, they snuck into the capital and delivered the first destined death in a millennia. Godwin should have died a clean, true death, but he did not. Instead, as the mark of death was being carved into his flesh, it was at that very moment also being carved into another of his kin, the Lunar Princess Rani. Rani got her wish and perished in flesh alone, which freed her soul. But Godwin died in spirit alone, and so his body suffered an unimaginable fate. His living corpse would spread a peculiar brand of undeath through the lands between via Deathroot, and wherever there is Deathroot, the Hunters of the Dead are sure to follow. There's no mistake, is there? Death has left its mark once again. I'm sorry, I cannot give you your proper rights, but at least you did not join those who live in death. Your soul will return to the Erd Tree in time. Ah, a tarnished, are you? I'm known as D. I hunt down those who live in death and weed their death root. Heed my warning. The village here has been touched by death, and worse yet, it is home to a mariner. If you value your life, then go no further. The dead have long been left to wander, and what they need is true leadership. The mariners can call to those who live in death and offer them some semblance of guidance, but they make poor leaders and even poorer fighters. So it is that the dead continue to live without purpose. Well, well. Another fool who won't listen to reason, eh? But with a prowess for weed in Deathroot. I spotted the mark of the centipede here in the village. An ill omen symbol that should not be. Someone or something threatens the sanctity of the Golden Order and must be eradicated. Hmm. D claims to have seen the mark of the centipede in this village, and it seems he's talking about the death root here, which is at the very heart of those who live in death. This death root carries the curse of the centipedal half-wheel wound, which raises the dead from their graves, ordering their bodies to life, without a soul, without guidance, and without grace. How would you like to earn the strength of beasts? If you're inclined to haunt more of those who live in death and weed their death root, then I'll introduce you to Garank. I have a matter of my own to attend to, and the beast himself wishes for someone to take my place. What say you? Very well. Show me your map. I've marked the location for you. It will lead you to Garank, the beast clergyman. 
The bestial sanctum lies past Faroon Great Bridge, deep within the Caled Wilds, past the vulgar militiamen, who are short, brutal mercenaries, and the Blackblade Kindred, who are a patchwork of champions put back together with corpse wax. They're all here in defense of Garank. Or should I say, Malakath? He is Marika's loyal shadow, that once kept the Rune of Death bound within his black blade. That is, until a piece of that death was stolen. Afterwards, he buried the black blade deep within his very self, so that no one could steal it ever again. Mm. I smell it. Death. Feed it me. Suffused with the Rune of Death, Malekith now hungers for Deathroot, desperate to gather back what he strongly feels are the missing parts of himself. Tarnished, bring more death. I shall grant thee eye and claw. Feed me more. But there was a time before the Rune of Death was bound. And so, there were other cultures of death, ways that were even practiced outside the Lands Between, where the Tarnished lived in exile. Greetings, great champion called by grace. I am Fia. Circumstances have compelled my stay at the Round Table Hold. Great champion, would you allow me to hold you? But briefly, my thanks. You are very warm. I was known as a deathbed companion. Where I come from, after I received the warmth and lively vigor from a number of champions, I lay with the remains of an exalted noble to grant him another chance at life. To do so, is the purpose of my being. But before I could bear the noble into new life, I was awakened by the guidance of grace and chased from my birthplace. Originally, the deathbed companions existed to provide a simple comfort to those who were dying. But at some point, it seems, it was discovered that a deathbed companion could use the vitality of others to birth dead remains into new life. And so the deathbed companions became a tool, a path to rebirth for the privileged, who told the deathbed companions who to lie with and when, so that one exalted being might get a second chance at life. Despite all that, I still wish to be a deathbed companion, so please, let me hold you like this, as often as it takes. But it's not all about you. After all, you are not the only tarnished that fear lays with, and who knows what secrets are shared in her bedchamber. Ah, nice to meet you. The pleasure's mine. Roger is the name. I'm looking for a little something here in the castle, when I'm not hot-footing it from the troops, that is. But enough about me. What are you doing here in Stormvale Castle? This place is bristling with tarnished hunters, you know. They sacrifice our kind for grafting. Not exactly a place I'd stroll into without a purpose in mind. Many external threats have laid waste to Stormvale over the years, and now the castle is marred by mottled thorns that have worked their way through the tortured stone. The soldiers mutter that it's the curse of grafting that causes such an affliction, but some talk of its root being something much more sinister, hidden deep below the castle. That is why Roger is here, on a mission of his own. And as you square up against Godric, he is searching for the source of the mottled thorns, and he finds it. For the world has grown crooked, and if one intends to put it to rights, then they'd best understand what happened to make it that way. 
no matter the cost. The world is slowly being taken over by the death root that is Godwin. For when Godwin died, his body was buried in the deep root depths in what seems like an esteemed position directly below the Erd tree. This would have been done in accordance with the practice of Erd tree burial, a process which replaced destined death. For under Marika's golden order, death exists, but it is not the end, and the roots of the Erd tree should call to all of the dead in time, reabsorbing them into the great tree where they may one day be reborn. Godwin, being a great hero, likely received the burial rites that placed him as close to the Erd tree as possible, but this backfired horrifically, for the roots would instead take up Godwin's cursed essence, like a tree absorbs water, and spread the mark of the centipede throughout the lands between via death root. So it is that those who live in death were born, and the hunters of the dead would follow. I serve the Golden Order, that I might put this crooked land to rights, following only the guidance of the Great Elden Ring. Those who live in death fall outside the principles of the Golden Order. Their mere existence sullies the guidance of gold, tainting its truth. And so it is, the vermin must be exterminated down to the very last. The Hunters of the Dead are fanatics, who are glad to have an absolute evil to contend with. But does such an evil even exist in the fundamentals of order? Are you acquainted with a man named Roger? You know, the piteous fellow hiding away on the balcony. He was a formidable spellblade in times past. Don't let his easy air deceive you. He was wise beyond his years, stout of heart and clear of mind. Ah, so you've met D. D is an old friend. We found ourselves journeying together for a time, bound by our exploration of death. But our paths have since diverged, never again to cross. Though that's hardly an uncommon fate for two friends. No more, though. You see him now, ravaged by thorns, muttering and rambling, like he's half dead already. Couldn't change a thing. I can't stomach to watch. Take well the lesson, friend. That's how you end up when seduced by those who live in death. When grace is solid, it rots people from the inside breaks them. This is what the Golden Order has been reduced to. Godric, the runt of the litter, dependent on the strength of tarnished champions. But Fia's favor is bestowed upon her consorts. It allows them to ignore any aches or pains, for in death there is only peace. For in death, there can be no sensation. Ah, you defeated Godric and claimed yourself a great rune. Hmm. Looks like we both got what we wanted out of Stormvale, didn't we? Well done, friend. Always good to see you safe. So, the misshapen corpse under Stormvale. That is a sacred relic of the Black Knives plot, as that famed Knight of Assassination is known. It happened during the Golden Age of the Erd Tree, long before the shattering of the Elden Ring. Someone stole a fragment of the Rune of Death from Maleketh, the Black Blade, and on a bitter night, murdered Godwin the Golden. That was the first recorded death of a demigod in all history, and it became the catalyst. Soon, the Elden Ring was smashed, and thus sprang forth the war known as the Shattering. I once wished to become a scholar, you see. I've spent many an hour scouring the archives for knowledge of that fateful plot. And 
That thing is to blame for the shape I'm in now. I urge the utmost caution. Don't disturb the corpse more than necessary. My dear, have you ever heard of Black Knife Prince? Dear Roger likes to talk of them when abed. And the ancient plot in which the first of the demigods was slain. The black knives wielded by the assassins who committed the act, along with the impressions they made, somehow hide the truth of the conspiracy. These grand affairs are hardly my forte, but dear Roger began to weep as he spoke. In truth, I've heard tell from someone else about the Black Knife Prince that fascinate dear Roger so, but it wouldn't be right to give this to him, stuck as he is in the round table hole. Perhaps you could make use of it? With a crudely drawn map in hand, we can find a living Black Knife, one of many who lurk purposeless in the dark places of the lands between, and D is here to help you. Ah, hello. You've been busy weeding death root, I take it. I thank you, as your brother in arms. The Black Knives were, after all, instrumental in undoing Dee's beloved order. So here, he takes his revenge, and you walk away with an imprint of a black knife. This is a black knife print. I can scarcely believe you managed to get your hands on this. Please, I beg of you, lend me the knife print for a time. I'd love nothing more than to tease out its secrets. Half my body has been suffused with death. I'm certain it will help me see. Though only a fragment, a very specific ritual had to be performed to impart the power of the rune of death. Traces of the one who performed the rite are sure to remain in the imprint. Truly, you have my thanks. Time can move rather slowly, stuck here, you know. A little conversation goes a long way. So Roger continues his investigation, and you continue to seek out Deathroot, waiting for the truth of things to be revealed. You are basically put to good use by everyone around you. I am pleased to see you again. Would you like me to hold you? Now, come closer. You are so very warm. I heard that you lent a hand to dear Roger. He seemed positively elated. He must be possessed of great mental fortitude. It anchors his will and sustains him. Despite his grievous wounds, you truly are a champion to dear Roger and myself too. My dear, might I ask something of you? Could you please find the owner of this dagger and return it to them? A certain person gave it to me as a gift. It's a very precious thing. It must have a special place in the owner's heart. So I would like for the original owner to have it back, if you wouldn't mind. This weathered dagger was once a special weapon of gold and silver intertwined, except now it has been worn down and marred by a black gash. It's natural to think that this weapon belongs to Dee, but then why didn't Fia give it back to him herself? Well, what have we here? How did you get your hands on that dagger? Well, that hardly 
hardly matters. I know very well whose dagger it is. Why don't I return it to them for you? Good work bringing this to me. It's almost as if they're playing a game with the dagger, arguing over whose heart it truly deserves to be buried within. And it's a game that D ends up losing. Fafia developed a sorcery to oppose the round table hold, a mist of death blight that is only effective against the tarnished, especially if they confront you in a small enclosed room. Finally, it is returned to its rightful place, the stolen Hallowbrand of the exalted noble. And now, I must bid you goodbye as well, though I ask you deliver this message to the round table hold. I am Fia, deathbed companion, hark round table. Disturb not the death of Godwin, the exalted. We who humbly live in death, live in waiting to one day welcome our Lord. What right does anyone have to object? Our Lord will rise the lord of the many, and the meek. All this time, Fia was getting closer to recovering the Hallowbrand that Dee stole from Godwin. For this Hallowbrand is the key. It's the curse mark that the Black Knives carved to split death in half, which started all of this in the first place, and Fia has a use for it, while Dee is dead. D is also alive, for Devon and Darian are the inseparable twins. They are of two bodies and two minds, but one single soul. Supposedly, this made them reviled by many, but they found solace within the Golden Order, which accepted their duality of the self. They even had armaments forged to represent their state of being. An inseparable sword and a twinned suit of armor and these items long to find their way back to the other D, who yet lives. Devon slumbers in the Eternal City, tormented by death blight. And it's here that he is said to have stood before the Prince of Death, suggesting he was the one who carved the curse mark from Godwin's flesh. Perhaps he even used a weathered dagger to carve it out, and perhaps this dagger was then mockingly gifted to a rotten witch setting into motion the events that would lead to his brother Darian's death. The Mariners are a joke making your hunt for the spreading death root an easy one. It shows up in Limgrave, in Leonia, even in the mountaintops of the Giants, and it is most common wherever there is stagnant water, which is a medium that represents corruption and defilement, and the death root infects all manner of creatures who meet their end sporting these distorted pustules of Godwin's own visage. Death root even starts to get the better of Marika's own shadow, after all, in the end, what we're feeding him is now much more than just the missing fragments of the Rune of Death. Something has changed. Strange. There's something else. I must consume more. It 
is... It is all... consumed. Still, I am not sated. Not nearly sated. America! Is this... what it is? To sin? Will things... never be the same... again? Thanks for thy long labor, but I have done all I can in this land. Henceforth, mine appetite shall be my sole companion. Farewell. Ah, hello. I was hoping to see you. My examination is complete. Here's the knife print back, with my thanks. Now I have a fairly good idea who performed the rite upon the blade. The person who orchestrated the Knight of the Black Knives. Luna Princess Rani. One of the children born to King Consort Radigan and his first wife, Ranala. Demigod and sister to General Radan and Praetor Rikard. Hers was the name I discovered in the imprint. If Rani truly is the one who plotted that fateful night, then she should bear the curse mark of destined death somewhere upon her flesh. I would like you to procure it for me. And then all will be laid bare. I will have the answers I have sought for so long. Do you know of those who live in death? These souls have committed no offence. They have every right to life, only they happen to touch upon a flaw in the Order. By Dee's account, these defiled fiends must be expunged. But truth be told, I seek the curse mark to save them. If we're looking for someone to blame in all of this mess, then where do we land? Does the guilt lie with those who live in death, who touched Deathroot? Or with Godwin, who spawned it? Or should we blame Rani, who thought up the plot in the first place? Personally, I think any fault goes even further back to Marika, who, in her hubris, thought that she could free the world from death. Death and life should never have been separated, a fact that is more clear now than ever. Maybe I should tell you. Lately, I feel I'm on the precipice of falling into a deep, fathomless slumber. And I have an inkling it could spell trouble for you somehow. So I just wanted to get the apology out of the way beforehand. Since you're so scary and all. Well, this is unfortunate. Um... So, whoever can obtain two halves of the curse mark can form a rune. With his dying breath, Roger hints that Fia might be able to use this. And a letter, scrawled by Roger on his deathbed, tells us one last thing. It's that D had a twin brother, and that the other D might be found in an aqueduct beside the eternal city of Nokron. Roger implores us to put his friend to rest reunite the twins, which we do by returning Dee's armor. Uh, 
da, da, ri. <laughs> Roger goes on to reveal that Devon stood before Godwin, not far beyond this spot, and indeed Devon and the dagger were death blighted. So we travel a little farther, upwards to a nameless city that's overtaken by roots, and Godwin himself. Oh, Lord Godwin. Oh, my poor sweet lordling should have died a true death. A scion of the Golden Bough, sentenced to live in death. How could such a thing come to be? Oh. Here, fear finally lies with Godwin, the Prince of Death, defending his being with the sapped strength of every hero who lay with her. Including, of course, the famed Spellblade, Roger. What is it you intend? To deny us and our ways, like the dogmatic brutes of the Golden Order? You are an odd one. I am the guardian of those who live in death. They call me a foul and rotten witch. Yet you still wish to be held by me? This is the other Hallowbrand. How did you... Oh, my utmost thanks. With this, Godwin can take his rightful place as first of the dead and claim a second, illustrious life. You are my, our, true champion. And though I can't be of any use to you, can I hold you tight? If only for a moment. I will soon lay with Godwin, and it will surely stir within me. The new life of the Golden Prince, and first dead of the demigods, as the rune of those who live in death. Please, do one thing for me. Brandish this child, my rune, and take for yourself the throne. Stay the persecution of those who live in death by becoming our Elden Lord. This is goodbye, my dear, but I am satisfied. I choose to lie with Godwin of my own will, not the remains of one chosen for me, and I will bear a child who will inherit your warmth too. What greater blessing could there be but to be born a deathbed companion? Now, Fia can fulfill her purpose and initiate a rebirth, a gestated rune that tells the broken story of those who live in death. So, Fia lies with Godwin, and she dreams. But it's within this dream that we realize that there is something lurking inside the Prince of Death, a being who, even after all this time, never once stopped fighting against the death in their companion. They are the last thing that stands between Godwin and his new life, and here they refused to let go, for Godwin was a friend, and they were the great ancient dragon, Dread Fortisax.
Finally, you can bring the entire broken curse mark itself into order. The mending rune of the Death Prince, which enables his bastardization of life to become an official part of Death's story. But first, you have to burn down the Erd Tree and walk alongside Flame to meet the road of destined death, which leads to Faram Azula, a broken city floating outside of time. And against all logic, Deathroot now grows here too. Turns out, nowhere is safe from its touch, even in Faram Azula, where the true rune of death is still protected by none other than Malakath, who masqueraded as Garank, so that you might feed him Deathroot and help him to achieve the one and only task that Marika saw fit to entrust him with. Astonished. Why cover destined death? It is no matter. I hereby vow that destined death shall not be stolen again. Cower before Malekith, Marika's black blade. of death. Take a good long look. See the wrath of the Golden Order, the Order's justice writ in blood. This is what's become of your precious witch. Look at this rotten hole. No more children can be got from this useless flesh. This is a proper death, O oh Prince. Behold, your mother is dead. <laughs> this is revenge, you witch. And you, you ghoul. This is the wrath of D. Ah, hello. The rotten witch is dead. The golden order unsullied. Now I can look my brother Darian in the eye. Honeyed rays of gold, deliver my spirit. Darian, honeyed rays of gold. Ah, don't you dare, unless you want to die like a dog. Very well. Die, die, die.
then you are a blight. A defiler of the Golden Order and murderer of my brother. I'll grind your corpse into the... Forgive me. Dari. Dari. As a deathbed companion, Fia had no choice but to lie with others until the guidance of Grace led her back to the Lands Between, where she used her chambers in the Round Table Hold to great effect, biding her time, listening to the secrets told to her in private, until she could use the strength of champions to speak for others, for the downtrodden, who had no champion. But soon, they will. Do one thing for me. Brandish this child, my rune, and take for yourself the throne. Stay the persecution of those who live in death by becoming our Elden Lord. Fia has finally lain with the remains of one that she chose, so that she might gestate a new beginning, called the Mending Rune of Those Who Live in Death, a gift to the undead, who were born at the very end of an age, duskborn, before the sun rises once more in a land where they no longer have to hide. The fallen leaves tell a story of how a tarnished became Elden Lord. In our home, across the fog, the lands between, our seed will look back upon us and recall the age of the Duskborn. Hope you all enjoyed the video. Uh, we've now covered three of Elden Ring's endings through Prepare to Cry. Four if you include the first video about Alexander being kind of related to the Age of Fracture ending, which is how I think about it in my head. And I'm thinking the next episode will be the last one based around an ending. And I'm sure you can guess who's up next. It's time to talk about Rani. Roger did a lot of work in this episode, sort of setting up her story. That's kind of his legacy in-game, in a way, to set it up. And we have a ton to work with for that episode. I'm really excited. Special thanks, as always, to my partner on this project, Miss Pap one who was in charge of all the visuals in this episode. And just look at these shots. They're absolutely insane. It's like watching an in-game cutscene half the time. Special thanks also to Quelag and Smotown for debating D and Fia's questline with me over Discord, because honestly, there are quite a few ways that you can interpret the weather dagger part of that questline, and I hope I did a decent job presenting that part of the video because it's always really hard telling a story when there are multiple valid interpretations of an event that could all be the right one, 
you know, because Prepare to Cry is a series that sort of relies on me telling the story fairly confidently, uh, because I don't always want to be saying, you know, maybe Fear got the dagger from this person, or maybe she gave it to Darian for this reason, or maybe this, or maybe that. I, there are other videos where I'm happy to do that, but Prepare to Cry, I prefer to have one interpretation, and this is mine, but I do want to flag that this interpretation might differ from your own, and that is totally fine. Anyway, I also want to give a shout out to the artist for the intro, who is John Devlin, and also the animator for that section, who is Xavier, and together they created some truly awesome scenes with the dragons and Godwin and Rani, and it's so great to have their help in creating these scenes that we never got to see. So. Thank you to them for that. And then thank you to my patrons who make commissioning amazing work like this possible. I hope you're all enjoying the early access, the wallpapers, and the exclusive merch. Thank you. And of course, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.